Welcome to EF5 training. This is module 1.2 from the University of Oklahoma Hydrometeorology and Remote Sensing Group. My name is Ray Sklar. Thank you for joining us. So we're now on to the second module of day one. If you haven't watched the video for the welcome module, which is the first one, you should go back and do that before you continue forward with this part of the training. If you've already done the welcome, then welcome once again. And now we'll get started with module two, an introduction to hydrological models. And so what we're going to talk about in this module is the water cycle. We're going to define a series of hydrological processes. We're going to talk about how we model those processes. And then at the end of this module, we're actually going to run E5 for the first time, and we'll create a hydrograph uh, based on the results of that initial run. So the water cycle, um, the most simple definition of it is that it's the movement of water between ice, the oceans, the atmosphere, and the various freshwater bodies across Earth's surface and underground as well. It consists of several processes, all of which are outlined at the right of this slide with various arrows. So precipitation, that's condensed atmospheric water falling to Earth. Evaporation and transpiration, we put those two together and we call them evapotranspiration. Those are either a phase transition of liquid to a gas occurring from a liquid surface. So you can think of that as evaporation. That's like what happens on a hot summer day when there's a rain puddle in the middle of the street. Um, and then transpiration is similar to that, but it's movement within and out of plants in the atmosphere. Infiltration is water that enters the soil from the ground surface. Runoff is the flow of water along the Earth's surface or over the Earth's surface. Interflow happens down inside the Earth's surface, which means that we don't see it very often, but it's still very important to model. And that's the flow of water within the various soil layers. And then routing is the movement of water downstream. And so that can occur from small invisible streams or little rivulets and fields, then down into brooks, and then larger streams, and then rivers, and then eventually the ocean. So precipitation can take many forms, um, and we divide those basically into ice and water. So if it's ice, it can be snow, hail, gravel, or sweet. If it's water, it can fall as rain or drizzle, and it can be measured in a couple of different ways, either as a series of points, like rain gauges, like at the bottom left of the slide, or it can be measured over an area using satellite or radar, um, and so we have an example of a rain gauge network in the U.S. state of Kentucky there at lower left, and then an example of the average annual rainfall over the continent of Africa as remotely sensed from NASA satellites um, at the lower right. But we generally prefer grid precipitation, and so the way we get that is we can either use a series of rain gauges or point data and analyze them off the grid so that we have values everywhere, or um, we could actually use weather radar or satellite um, estimates directly and derive precipitation estimates from those and then they're already in a grid ready to go. And so a hydrological model is actually fed with precipitation grids at regular intervals throughout the length of the simulation. And so a satellite uh, may provide an estimate of precipitation every three hours or every six hours or every 12 hours. Weather radar may provide an estimate every two minutes or five minutes or ten minutes. Rain gauge reports uh, might happen every minute or once a day. And depending on what those intervals are, that helps to guide how often you want to run a hydrological model. But not all precipitation is going to reach the ground. Um, some amount of the precipitation actually evaporates or sublimes back into the atmosphere as a gas before it ever reaches the ground. That's especially true if the atmosphere is very, very dry at the beginning of a rainy storm um, or during very light rain as well. Some is intercepted by what we call the canopy. And so the canopy consists of things like plants and trees, consists of rain barrels, if people are collecting rainwater, then that's water that collects in a barrel, it doesn't actually make it to the ground. And so in the model, we treat all of those different things as the canopy. And the way hydrological models deal with this is to basically make that intercepted rainfall, so that rain that either evaporates out of the atmosphere, or the rain that is caught by rain barrels of plants and trees, part of the evapotranspiration process. And so evapotranspiration is just the addition of evaporation and transpiration. We take the two words and put them together into the one big, long, fancy word. And evaporation is just a general term for the conversion of a liquid from its surface into a gas. So that could be a puddle, it could be the top of a rain barrel, it could be a lake, it could even be a river. And so in this case, the liquid is always water, and the liquid surface um, can be either the surface of those various reservoirs, or it could be the land surface, which could include things like soil and concrete. Transpiration is a more specific term, and it refers specifically to the transfer of the liquid water from plants into the atmosphere as a vapor, as water vapor. So since evapotranspiration is hard to measure, we usually try to calculate it indirectly. So we'll start with just a basic principle of the water cycle, which is that water is neither created nor destroyed. So in equation form, water in equals water out. 
So if we have a river, like we have on this slide, let's draw a box around that river basin, and we'll see what goes in and what goes out. So in this case, the arrows pointing in, there's just one, it's precipitation. And there are three arrows pointing out of the river basin, and those are groundwater, stream flow, and evapotranspiration. And then inside, we have a box that doesn't have any arrow on it at all, and that's called storage change. So let's say that storage change is S, and so our equation now is S equals P, minus all of those things that are leaving um, the box. So that's ET, short for evapotranspiration, groundwater, or G, and stream flow, which is Q. We would use S for stream flow, but we already used S for storage change. And in fact, in hydrology and in hydrologic modeling, Q is typically the letter used to represent stream flow. So we can measure, or at least we can estimate, Q for stream flow, G or groundwater, P for precipitation, and S for storage change, and then we can rearrange that equation from the previous slide and solve for ET. So mathematically, ET, or evapotranspiration, now equals P minus S minus Q minus G. The reason ET is hard or impossible to measure is because it varies drastically across very small scales on the Earth's surface. And I've just listed a few of the factors that matter for calculating ET. There are even more than this. But the species of plant involved, the age and health of the plant, the sun angle, the sky cover, the temperature, the wind, the humidity, the land cover, and many more factors actually all work together to determine what the real value of ET is. And so you see, it would be hard to measure even just a few of those things, much less all of them everywhere. So that's why we try to just estimate ET instead. It can be measured experimentally, but it's expensive, difficult, and subject to error. So now our cartoon, now that we know more about evapotranspiration, it more accurately reflects what can happen in a model. So we still have the downward pointing error of precipitation, which is water being transferred from the atmosphere down to the land. But now evapotranspiration acts on the precipitation itself. It acts on trees and plants. And it also acts on the ground. We express PET as a water depth. So it can be expressed in millimeters or centimeters usually. And this amount of water is always going to be removed from the model. So if we have enough precipitation available, that is, if the precipitation rate is higher than the evapotranspiration rate, we just go ahead and take all that evapotranspiration out of the precipitation. But if that's not the case, it's getting more complicated, and we have to look for other sources of water. So here are the steps. We have them labeled with arrows and boxes with little numbers in them. Step one, we have a bucket that contains precipitation. PET takes water from the precipitation bucket until the PET bucket is full. Then it's time for step two. If the PET bucket is still not full, it takes water from the rest of the model. So that is surface water and groundwater. Once PET is full, the rest of the water in the precipitation bucket empties out along area three and starts to fill up the surface water and groundwater buckets. We'll come back and talk more about PET in module 2.1, but next we need to answer what exactly happens after step three. So at this point, our PET requirement is satisfied and our precipitation is free to reach the land surface. We know some portion of this water is going to drain into the soil and we know some other portion of it is going to run off on top of the soil. And this happens for a couple of reasons. One is fairly easy to imagine. So if you're in a city and you have lots of concrete, asphalt, bricks, other hard surfaces that don't absorb water, the water doesn't have anywhere to go. It has to go on top of all those surfaces. And so that's actually governed by something called the percent impervious area of the region being modeled. Percent impervious area is much higher in cities than it is in rural areas with lots of farms and ranches and natural landscapes. The other reason why it runs off is a little trickier to think of. Soil absorbs some water, but after a certain point, even that water starts to run off. You can test this by going outside, and if you took something like an eyedropper or an eardropper, and you squeezed a few water droplets onto some dry soil, the water will very quickly absorb down into the soil. Now go back out into that same area and take a big water pitcher and pour that out on the soil all at once, and the water will spread out. It'll start to run off. So when we have really heavy rainfall rates, we create more runoff because the soil can't handle all of that water. These two processes are called runoff and infiltration. So runoff is just water that when it reaches the land surface, it doesn't infiltrate into the soil, but it instead flows over the land surface. Infiltration is the opposite of that. It's water that flows into the land surface. And so we need our model to help us decide how much water becomes runoff and how much is infiltrated. So when we're discussing infiltration, one way to visualize how this process works is through use of something called an infiltration capacity curve. 
um, which is in orange at the right of this slide. So this is the maximum amount of water that can be absorbed into the soil. And so in this case, the bar chart represents precipitation amounts over time. And so any rain that's falling on top of the orange curve is excess rainfall. That's rain that has to be kind of runoff. Less rain than that, rain below that curve, that can be absorbed by the soil. That can be infiltrated. And so that actually makes its way down into the soil layers. And so this curve helps us determine which percentage of the water actually goes out as runoff and which percentage goes out as infiltration capacity. You'll notice that as we get farther and farther in time and as we have more and more rainfall, that orange curve gets lower and lower, and so less and less rain can actually be absorbed. That's governed by the properties of the soil and by how fast the rain is falling and by what amount it's falling, but that curve never quite reaches zero. There's always some small percentage of water that's going to be absorbed into the soil. This method is fairly easy to understand, but it tends to only work at one point. It doesn't account for spatial differences in soil properties that you might have over a large river basin or over a country or over a continent even. And so, Instead of the infiltration capacity curve, we're going to talk about something called a storage capacity curve, and that helps us account for the spatial differences in these soil properties. So I have an example or a static of a variable infiltration curve. Um, this is from a paper from 1980 from an early hydrological model. And in this case, they were basically using a bunch of different letters to try to describe various quantities that involve soil and its infiltration capacity. So F, um, which you see down at the bottom right of this figure, Big F is the total area of the basin, and little f is the partial area, or the area we're considering. And so as you move from left to right across the figure, over on the left-hand side where you see a zero, we're not considering any of the basin there. And over at the right-hand side where you see 1.0, we're considering the entire basin. And so the curve um, is the area with storage capacity equal to or less than a value of Wm prime. And so what you're going to do is you're going to look at the vertical axis, which is Wm prime, and that's going to give you the capacity at a particular point within the basin. The curve actually reaches a max point and then levels off the flat line at W max prime, which is the maximum storage capacity anywhere in the basin. So when little f over big F is less than 1.0, from the curve we know that Wm prime is less than W max prime, and that's what you should expect the point storage capacity is going to be less than the maximum storage capacity anywhere in the basin. So WM, or this curve, that's the point storage capacity. That's the capacity of the soil to absorb water at any one given point within the basin. W, which is that area under the basin, the big W, that is the actual storage of water in the basin. And so you can also think of um, this as how groundwater moves through the basin. So in some parts of the basin, in real life, it might be wetter than others. But for this um, example, we're going to assume that groundwater can move easily in the horizontal direction, so that it's at the same level across the entire basin, so that it's flat, in other words. And that's why W is flat. That's why the top edge of W is a horizontal line. It's not tilted or slanted or curved at all. So W is always the same, regardless of the value of um, little f over big f. To that storage, we're going to add PE, and so P minus E, um, that's actually the precipitation minus the evapotranspiration, so that's the amount of water that actually makes it down to the Earth's surface into the basin. And we know that that's also going to be distributed evenly because we have interflow, which allows the water to go anywhere it wants horizontally fairly easily. So that P minus E is also flat, just like W was. And um, only part of that, though, fits under the infiltration capacity curve. That's L, which stands for loss. The part that doesn't fit under that curve is excess rainfall, R for runoff. So let's put some numbers to this. If W max prime is 25 millimeters and W is 10 millimeters, <coughs> and P is 10 millimeters and E is 5 millimeters, that means that P minus E is 5 millimeters. So we're adding 5 millimeters of water to that 10 millimeters of water that was already in W. If big F is 100 square kilometers, then the volume of R plus L has to be 500,000 cubic meters. And we want to know which portion of that is runoff and which portion of it is loss. And so just looking graphically um, at the figure, about 25% of that would be R or runoff. And that's about 125,000 cubic meters. And that amount of R is governed by the shape of the curve, which depends on the properties of the soil 
And when it comes to modeling, it also depends on the settings you provide to the hydrological model. Now let's look at it from a spatial perspective, and let's say that we measure WM prime at a point in the basin that's 20 millimeters. So remember from our previous example, W max prime is 25 millimeters. So you want to follow the horizontal red line on the figure, and you're going to go straight out horizontally from the edge until you reach the curve. And we want to answer the question, which portion of the basin has a WM prime greater than that value? So if I use the curve and I go straight down, I get about 50% because I'm about halfway between 0 and 1, or 50%. If I were to measure uh, WM prime as 10 millimeters instead, and I go across, then my answer is 85%. About 85% of the basin has a storage capacity greater than 10 millimeters. And you can see I've done math for this example for 25%, 50%, 90%, 75%, etc. And all of these things, again, are governed by the curve. They're based on the curve. So let's look at the general characteristics of a bit or variable infiltration curve. As P increases, that R and L layer grows bigger, which means that R grows bigger. So the more precipitation, the more runoff you have. As E increases, remember E is negative, so that makes R decrease. It shrinks R minus L. We know that E is related to evapotranspiration, so the more sunlight you have, the less runoff you have, as more of the water is going back into the atmosphere. When W is low, or when the soil is dry and there's not much water stored in it, R is smaller. Um, whenever W increases, the fraction of P minus E that becomes R, so basically this R, increases as well. So the wetter the soil is initially, the more runoff I have. When W is small, I have um, much less runoff because I have more capacity, uh, based on the curve, for um, there to be loss, there to be infiltration. So, all of these sort of things should sort of be intuitive. And feel free to pause the video and rewind it in this point because these are really important concepts that um, will help you do sanity checks once you start running the model to make sure that the results you're getting actually make sense. But in general, just keep in mind the more precipitation you have, the more runoff you have. The less evapotranspiration you have, the more runoff you have. Um, the drier the soil is, the less runoff you have. The wetter the soil is, the more runoff you have. Those are all general things that we kind of know intuitively that we can also get from looking at this graph or even from assigning numbers to the various values and doing the math ourselves. <laughs> and this slide here is just a recapitulation of what I had just previously said. And again, this just illustrates the various relationships between P, E, R, L, W, F, and um, all of those various factors are things that are being modeled you won't necessarily see them in the model, but they're things that you should constantly have in the back of your mind as you're using and interpreting the model results. So let's go back to the water cycle, which is where we initially started. And now the things that are highlighted in red, so we have the VIC, and then we have precipitation, evapotranspiration, infiltration, and runoff, all certain in that VIC. These are all things that we've discussed. Now we need to discuss interflow, routing, and storage change. So interflow, um, the portion of the precipitation that reaches the soil, which we're going to call P soil, Vic tells us which part of that infiltrates down into the soil and which part is excess rain that runs off to the side. Excess rain exists in two forms, as interflow and overland runoff. So when P soil is less than the infiltration rate of the soil, all of the P soil becomes interflow and no overland runoff is produced. This is whenever the soil can absorb all of the water. The soil is very dry, or the rainfall is very light, or both, and all of the water is absorbed into the soil and becomes interflow. There's no overland runoff in that case. Otherwise, we partition or divide pea soil based on something called the hydraulic conductivity, and that's how easy it is for water to enter the soil. So if you have some sort of soil um, with very fine particles that are compressed close together and water can't get down into it, the hydraulic conductivity is low. If you have something like sand or gravel, where there's huge areas of air inside there and big pieces of soil, and the water drains through it very easily, then hydraulic conductivity is much higher. The higher the hydraulic conductivity is, the more of the peak soil becomes runoff interflow, and the less um, it becomes overland runoff. Over overland runoff and the interflow, they can be routed or moved downstream via separate model processes. And so, in general, when you're looking at a hydrograph, or that is a plot of stream flow versus time, Hydrographs that peak really rapidly or streams that rise really rapidly, um, that's usually due to runoff. Streams that rise more slowly or gradually over time, that tends to be more due to interflow or flow through the soil. 
So now we've accounted for uh, all of the water that's entered the model. Some of it is evapotranspired. The rest is precipitation that reaches the soil, or pea soil. We also have then some of that going into infiltration, some of it is excess rainfall, and within that excess rainfall, part of it is overland runoff and part of it is interflow. So the question now is what happens to that interflow and overland runoff as they go from stream to stream, pool to pool, and lake to lake? Each type of flow is routed until it reaches something that the model considers to be a river channel. And it then becomes something called open channel flow. Now it's out in the middle of a river, everybody can see it, it's open to the sky, it's open to the earth. <coughs> the time required for this routing process is a function of several different things. The distance between where the precipitation occurred and the channel itself. The slope between these points, so areas that have higher slope, the water will flow down in a faster. And other empirical factors. For flows that occur within the soil, this factor is the soil saturated hydraulic conductivity for interflow. So this is related to what we mentioned a couple of slides ago, which is basically how easy it is for water to move through the soil. The easier it is for water to move through the soil, the more quickly it's going to be routed downstream to a river or an open channel. For overland runoff, or water going along the Earth's surface, this factor is the roughness of the land. So how rough the land is um, tends to affect how quickly the water can actually reach its downstream destination. Now if I stand at a point where overland water from upstream is flowing toward me, I need to account for that water that's coming toward me, that water that's already in the system. I have new water coming from up above that has to do with precipitation on the soil surface, but I have water that's already in the model upstream, and so I need to deal with that in some way. And so I can add that to my pea soil bucket. So I'm just going to add the upstream water to the bucket I already have, and in this case it acts just like additional precipitation falling from the sky, and the whole process can start over again. Evapotranspiration, infiltration, conversion into runoff, and conversion into interflow. And so you can see in this cartoon at right, the light blue colored area, that's the overland runoff from the previous cell. And in the downstream area, after routing, we flood our new bucket with this dark blue area, which is new precipitation falling at the new point where I'm standing. And um, if we're not in a river channel, that's how it works. It just works as new precipitation. If it is in a river channel, we skip all the evapotranspiration and everything else. And we just very simply add um, the upstream water that's already in the river to the downstream point. So if you're in a river channel, this process is really simple. You don't even have to go through the whole rigmarole again. All you have to do is just add the upstream water to what's already happening. Now, if overland water is flowing toward me, there's probably also water under the surface or in the soil called interflow that's flowing toward me. And so we account for that by adding new infiltration water um, at the downstream point. And so uh, that's what's being shown in this cartoon here. The light blue now is the overland runoff, and after routing, we're adding this dark blue area, which is newly generated overland runoff at that downstream point. And this upstream runoff, it can be treated only one way or the other, not both. Uh, the infiltration part of it down on the soil, that occurs no matter what, if it's a river channel or not. And so in the real world, what's happening all the time, even if we can't see it, is water is moving horizontally and vertically over and through the land at all times, at all points, and we're trying to model that as best we can. So, so far we've assessed this in terms of points, and really in terms of two points, the point where I started and some imaginary downstream point that I walked to after a certain time. But in reality, across a small basin even, there are an infinite number of these points. Computers like to think of things in terms of grids and cells, and so the way that we uh, do this is we basically divide the area we want to model into cells, and you, the user, picks the size and number of these cells. So in each process we've discussed so far, there are various factors and settings for how the process works. We talked about hydraulic conductivity, the roughness of the land surface, the equation of the storage capacity curve, or the VIC, and others as well. Each one of these is called parameters, and adjusting them can make a simulation in a model more or less accurate. And this process is called calibration, which we're going to discuss later on in Module 2.2. If I can adjust these parameters for each model cell independently, I have what's called a distributed model. If I can adjust these parameters at a few spots over a river basin, say where I have gauges located or some other instrument that I'm interested in, that's called a semi-distributed model. And if I have only one consistent set of all of those factors for the entire area I'm modeling, that's called a lumped model. So the water cycle, just to reiterate from the very beginning of this module, is the movement of water between the ice, the oceans, the atmosphere, and the fresh water. 
And what we're going to do is turn the water cycle into a series of model cells. And each model cell is going to contain all of the processes that we've talked about so far in this module. So we're going to take all of that stuff that we've already learned about each model cell, and we're going to multiply it by 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, depending on how big um, you decide to run your hydro model. So each cell contains all of these parameters and processes. So all of the things in white, um, those are basically descriptors of things that exist within the model. You can think of them as nouns. Things that appear in black, those are processes. So those are things that are acting upon the noun. So you can think of the things in black as verbs. And so those nouns and verbs, all of them exist inside every single model cell um, within a particular domain. So we have precipitation, evapotranspiration, runoff, infiltration, and all of these other processes and all these other things that should be familiar by this point um, for discussing them throughout this module. And what's really important about this particular diagram is what we have at the beginning and what we have at the end. Everything starts with precipitation, and everything ends with stream flow, and everything in the middle is model. And so the whole purpose of this modeling exercise is to determine the relationship between rainfall and stream flow. So all these cells are connected together, and they all govern how the others around them and connected to them behave. This process is very complex. If you try to do it with pencil and paper, it might take you years even to just model over a very, very small and small river basin. But computing power allows us to parallelize this. It allows us to do this for thousands of cells all at the same time. And in day-to-day -day use, we can reduce this all down to a single block diagram that consists of our inputs, our outputs, and then the model parameters. So we start with precipitation and PET. We feed those into a hydrological model that has parameters that we've set. And as a result of that, the model gives us stream flow and soil moisture. So what we're going to do for example one is start with the simplest possible use of the model. We're going to provide the inputs and the model parameters um, to you, ready to go. You don't have to do anything to them. And if that's the case, based on our plot diagram at the bottom of this slide, all you need to do is run a model. So let's go ahead and navigate to our first example folder, EE5 training slash examples slash Wing Chu. Okay, so it's now time to um, go ahead and run the Wang Chu Basin. So let's go to EF5 Training. And once I'm inside there, I'm going to go to the Examples folder. And I'm going to double click on Wang Chu. And you'll see that I have five folders here. And so I'm going to basically go through and describe what each of these five folders are. So the basic folder, that contains topographical data for the model. So if you want, you can go ahead and open that up. And inside, you'll see three files, DDM, DEM, and FAC. Um, inside the ops folder, we have a file called uh, CHUKA, or C-H-H-U-K-H-A. And so that's just a common separated file that has values of observed stream flow. Our output folder, that's where the model output is going to go at the end of the example. So it's empty right now because we haven't run the example yet. Inside our PET folder, we have a uh, 12 files, they're binary files, and so these are actually grids of PET that the model is going to read for us. And inside our precip folder, we have 730 items, and these are actually daily uh, rainfall estimates from satellite over the base of the model. So, the control dot the control dot tech file um, I'm going to go ahead and open that up, and we're going to look inside this, and we're actually going to become quite familiar with this file throughout the training, but this is our first look at it, and it contains basically a bunch of lines in a text file that have different options that tell EF5 what to do. So the basic files, those tell EF5 where to look for the DEM and the DDM and the FAM. It tells um, EF5 what type of precipitation files to look for, what the units of the precipitation are, where they're located. The same thing for PET information about the gauge, the model parameters, etc. So we're not going to change anything in the control file right now, but we just wanted to open it up for a second, make sure everything was there, and just trust me for now, for the first example, it looks just fine. And the folder organization within um, each example folder can be however you want it to be set up. You just have to make sure that the control file accurately reflects where all the files are located. So I find it easy to have this multiple folder structure. It's easier for me to keep track of where my basic files are, where my observations are and such, if I keep them in separate folders. But again, you can organize them however you want, as long as you change the control file to reflect those changes. 
And so some of the other blocks that we did look at down at the bottom, um, the parameter set blocks, the task block, the execute block, these are all things that we're going to cover um, in greater depth throughout the rest of the training. So at the very bottom of your folder, you have two files, run EF532 and run EF564. So if you remember back in the welcome session, we talked about 32-bit computers and 64-bit computers. If you had a 32-bit computer, you're going to double-click run EF5 underscore 32. If you have a 64-bit computer, you're going to double-click run EF5 underscore 64. So I'm going to go ahead and click the 64-bit one. And when I do, a big black window pops up and it says Ensemble Framework for Flash Flow Forecasting in the title. And then down below, it has a whole bunch of different uh, pieces of information. And so it's telling us that it's executing run Wang Chu. Um, it's telling us where the gauge is located. And then it says, it has that warning there at the bottom, fail to load LP3 grids. Don't worry about that. That's another option um, that's more advanced for EF5. You don't need to worry about it for now. And if everything is successful, down at the very bottom of this window, it should say done. And so mine says done. And since it does, I'm going to go ahead and click exit. And now I'm going to go into my output folder. And when I do, I now have a file here. It's called ts.chukka.crest.csv. So what we want to do now is um, we want to use Microsoft Excel, actually, um, to see what we can actually look at with the results to see what sort of hydrograph we can produce. OK, so we have this file, and we want to open this up in Microsoft Excel. So depending on where your Excel is installed, I'm going to go to the Start screen. I'm going to click on Excel 2013. And it's telling me um, to open other workbooks down here. I'm going to go to my computer. Now I'm going to look for my desktop, the EF5 training folder, Examples, Wang Chu, Output. And you see it shows that no items match the search at first, and that's because I'm opening a CSV file. So I'm going to change it to all files, and now I see the file I want. If you need to remember where we are, we're inside Desktop, EF5 Training, Examples, Wang Chu, Output. So I'm going to open up tschuka.crest.csv, and when I click Open, You'll see a whole bunch of data in Excel, so that's a good sign. And what we're going to do first is we're going to start off with just a pretty easy task. We're going to take all of the information that we've gotten from the model from this first example, and we're going to create a hydrograph from that. So first I want to see everything I have. So I selected all the columns that have data. I'm going to double click in between them, and Excel is going to expand things out for me so that I can see um, everything all at once. So you can see that the model gave us the time, discharge, or that's also stream flow, the observed stream flow, the precipitation, PET, percentage um, saturated that the soil is, and then these fast flow and slow flow columns. So what we're going to do um, is create a hydrograph. So up at the top of the window, what's called the ribbon, I am going to go to insert, and I'm going to insert a chart, and I'm going to select a line chart and then a 2D line chart as shown. And so when I select that, Excel shows me this little blank window here, so I'm going to drag this off to the side. And I'm going to go to Select Data. And I'm going to try to basically make things uh, clean. So I'm going to click this little arrow button, and now it's going to say Select Data Source. And I'm going to select everything. So I'm just going to drag across from uh, column A to column H. And when I do, you'll see that I get something really messy, just like what you see on slide 46 and 45 as well of the PowerPoint. Now, this procedure will look a little bit different depending on what version of Excel you're using. I'm using Excel 2013, and it's fairly similar in 2007 and 2010. But there will be slight differences, so just keep that in mind. Well, I'm going to go into the Select Data Source dialog box, and I'm going to turn off the things I don't want. So I don't care about slow flow. I don't care about fast flow. I don't care about soil moisture, it's not right now. And I don't care about PET right now. So that leaves discharge, observed, and precip. And then I'm going to click OK. And when I do, you see some of the lines on my chart disappear. Things are starting to clean up a little bit. But there's still a long way to go. The next thing I want to do is Right now, I have precipitation down at the bottom of this chart. You can see it when I click on it. All these little areas get highlighted. 
right along where the dates are. And those are actually precipitation values. And um, I don't want to be displaying them on the same chart as my discharge and my observations. Those are stream flow. Precipitation has totally different units. So the way to fix that is to right click on that series. And you can see it says series precip on my screen. And I'm going to go to format data series down at the bottom of that menu. And if you're on Excel 2010, you'll get a dialog box or a window that pops up. On Excel 2013, it pops up on the right-hand side of the screen. And I'm going to go to Series Options, Plot Series on Secondary Axis. And now you'll see a bunch of gray areas that appear all at once. That's our preset. We want to right-click on this new preset axis on the side here. And again, we're going to go to Format Axis. And this time, we're going to change a couple of options. We're going to change values in reverse order, which is about three quarters of the way down the page. So when I click that, all of a sudden those gray bars that represent preset flipped upside down. And then I want to get those gray bars out of the way. I don't want them to cover up my stream flow. And so the way I'm going to do that is by changing the upper bound of my axis. So rather than 1.6, let's try something like 20. You can do whatever you want, but 20 seems to work pretty well for this. And now you can see I've got this nice little gray area hanging down from the bottom of my chart. Um, and it's out of the way of all the extreme flow. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and make my chart bigger to make sure everybody can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm starting to get um, the basics of a hydrograph. But there's a few things that we still want to change. Number one is preset traditionally isn't shown as a line chart like it is here. So I'm going to go up to the top of the chart, right click on preset, and I'm going to go to change series chart type. And then I'm going to go down to Precip at the bottom of this dialog box. And this time I'm going to select Cluster Column, which at least on my computer is the first option you see. And when I click OK, now you see the Precip has turned into bars instead of lines. And that's much more like what we like to see. Let's also add um, some titles to the axis of our chart. So on Excel 2010 and older versions, you do this up at the top of the screen at the ribbon. On Excel 2013, there's a little plus sign up at the top right-hand corner of the chart. And when I click that plus sign, I see a whole bunch of options. And so I'm going to click next to Axis Titles. And when I do, now I have Axis Titles all around the outside. And the first thing you want to do with Axis Titles is make sure that they're big enough so that people can read them. So I'm going to change the font size to something like 20. And let's go ahead and type in what we want the access titles to be. So the chart title, let's call that Wang Chu Hydrograph. And then remember our precipitation is over on the right hand side, so let's say precipitation. And our units are in millimeters per hour. And then on the other side of the chart, we want to make sure that we have the units for stream flow, which are cubic meters per second. If you want to be really fancy, you can make the three subs or a superscript. But for now, I'm just going to use a parent. And then our bottom axis is just the date. Now, the time axis is a little bit weird right now. It's showing labels every two knots. But it's also showing the time with it, and we don't really care about that. We just really care about the days, right? So we're going to right-click on that, go to Format Axis, and you'll see a whole bunch of things appear. And what we want this time is number. And instead of custom, I'm going to change the category to date. And then there's a whole bunch of different options I can choose from. I personally am going to pick the one that has the abbreviated month and then the year. And now you can see, much easier to read, now I see February 2001, April 2001, June 2001, and on and on. Much, much better. On Office 2010, um, you may actually want to move your legend to the bottom, or you may want to create a legend. So remember, in Office 2010, you're going to do this at the top of the screen. I'm going to do it over here using this plus sign. So I'm going to click Yes on the legend. And then I'm going to go to Format Legend, and out here at the side of my screen, I'm 
I'm going to say that I want the legend to be at the bottom of the chart. And that lets us take up more of the space with the good stuff, the data that we actually want to see. Now, um, the colors that we picked maybe don't seem so natural. So the precipitation, um, you're going to want to right click on that and then do format data series. And so you can change the color that way. If you're on 2013 Excel, like me, um, you can actually right click and then it'll show up with fill and outline. And so you can just pick the colors that you want. And it's telling me that complex formatting may take a while to display, but I don't care too much about that. And so I changed my precip to green. That's pretty common to think of precip that way. In hydrology, we like to think of um, discharge as um, something that should appear um, in some color other than black. It should have contrast with black. So I'm going to pick red. And again, you can pick whatever color you want. Then I'm going to right click on my observations. And I'm going to change those to black. And that's actually pretty standard throughout hydrology that we like observed data to appear in black. So now our model is in red. And the observations from the stream gauge of this location are in black. And um, there's just a couple other minor things that I like to do. On the date axis, I want to actually be able to see the exact points when each of the new months start. So I'm going to right click and go to Format Axis. I'm going to go to Tick Marks. And I'm going to say Major Type Outside. And if I click the paint bucket, I can make them whatever color I want. So I'm going to make black. And it may be hard to see on your screen, but we're trying basically to show exactly, to be more precise about where exactly um, the individual months start. Another way to do that is to right click and click Add Major Grid Lines. And if you do that, now you'll see you have much more on the background of the chart to help you see things, to help you see where things are going on. Um, you can add various grid lines um, or various tick marks to their charts as well, to the axes as well. This all basically follows the same process. And really, this stuff is not critical for running the model. We like to go through it because if you're going to use this model in your work or in your education, um, oftentimes 90% of the battle is just making sure that you display your results in a user friendly way so that a boss or a manager or somebody knows exactly what it is they're looking at and feels comfortable interpreting that. So if you have skills with Chart making, whether you want to use Excel or some computer programming language or whatever else, it can be a very useful thing when you're using um, the model. And so that basically um, concludes making the hydrograph. So in the next module, which is F5 overview, we're actually going to talk about um, putting some numbers to these results. We can see the red, we can see the black, we can see the green, but we don't really know yet how good this simulation is. So we're going to calculate statistics next time to figure out if this result is good, bad, or somewhere in between. So hopefully we'll see you again for the next video, which is EF5 Overview. Um, until then, if you're interested in reviewing some of the references cited within this presentation, there are um, two of them from external sources. One is a paper from uh, 2011 that describes the Crest model physics, and so that's more of an in-depth discussion of what we talked about during the first half of this module. And then there's also a paper um, from Zhao et al., which describes um, one of Crest's forebears, one of the first models to use the variable infiltration curve um, system. So that's also available in the training packet. And then there's another document that describes the EF5 control file that you may want to take a look at as well. So until next time, until the EF5 overview, um, thanks for